Hello students, in today's lecture we will talk about the osteology of femur. In this lecture we will discuss about the different bony features of this bone, how to identify the side and what is the anatomical position of femur. So when you will see the femur, femur means thigh. So whenever we are having the word femur, we always concern with the thigh like the bone of the thigh is femur, artery is femoral artery now is femoral now. Now this is the longest bone of the body as you all know and its length is somewhere around 45 centimeter approximately. Now this is very commonly asked question in your exams about the length of femur bone. Now this length is constitute one fourth height of an individual, clear? So whatever the height is there of an individual, the one fourth contribution comes from the length of femur itself. Now how to do the side determination of the bone? Now when you, you know that there are right and left paired femurs are present in the human, so you have to identify that the bone which you are reading belong to right side of the body or left side of the body. So you have to first keep this bone vertically. Why vertically? Because whenever you are reading the long bones, you know that the features of long bones are that they lie vertically in the body, they are having two ends, upper and lower end, they are having three borders, they are having three surfaces and you know that they are also having the medullary cavity and these long, long bones will take part in the weight transmission. So because you are reading a long bone, so you have to keep this thing in mind that anatomically it lies vertically in the body. Now once you will keep this bone vertically, it is automatically having two head. One head is known as upper head and lower head. Now how to identify the upper head? Upper head is going to form the hip joint and that joint is a ball and socket joint. So there is a rounded ball type head is going to form the upper end and it is directed medially towards your acetabular cavity to form the hip joint. The lower end is broad and it is going to form the knee joint with the tibia. It is having a prominent crest and this crest is a feature of posterior surface and it is known as linea aspera, clear? So now in these two diagrams you can see that this is the bone which we are holding in vertical direction. Now once you will have the vertical placement of the bone, this round head is become the upper end and this broad part is become the lower end. But you have to keep this thing in mind that you have to differentiate the anterior and posterior surface. For, for that you will find this kind of the border and this prominent border is a feature of posterior surface not on the anterior surface. So this posterior surface is known as linea alba. So it comes on the posterior side and the head is facing medially so that it can make a joint with this acetabular cavity. So if I am having this bone in my hand, then this bone belong to my left side. Why? Because the head is placed in upper part. This is the broad lower part. The a head is facing medially and the anterior surface is, is smooth which is not having any border which is a prominent feature of posterior surface. Now what about anatomical position? Anatomical position means that how it is placed in the body. So when you will see the anatomical position, the head of the femur is directed upward medially and slightly forward. Now this is the important thing to understand that head of the femur is not having the plane with the shaft but it is tilted forward. Now here in this diagram if you will see you can see that this is the shaft of the femur. Now once you will see the shaft of the femur the head is having this tilted orientation. The head is not in this plane of the shaft. So you have to keep this thing in mind that when you will keep the anatomical position of femur, the femur is having the anterior or forward placement in term of head of the femur. 
then the lower surface of both the condyles on a horizontal plane so that the shaft ultimately become oblique now this is very very important thing to understand now here you can see that this is the placement of both the femur in a articulated skeleton now here what you are able to understand that this is your hip joint of both the side and this bone is having the shaft which is not vertically straight now if you see the shaft the shaft is having a tilt and this is the angle of the shaft so that what will happen that the medial placement of the lower end that means the lower end are more medially and the upper end are placed away from each other now this happened because of the this important issue that means that both the condyles of your femur now these are known as condyles now there are two condyle one is the medial condyle one is the lateral condyle now if you will see in this diagram now this diagram is showing that these condyles are making a joint with the tibial surface now what will happen here you can appreciate both the condyles are touching the superior surface of tibia now if you will make it straight now if you will make the shaft straight then what will happen the problem is that if i will keep this shaft vertically straight then the lower surface of the condyles are not in one plane now here you can appreciate that there is a clear cut gap is present between the one condyle and this horizontal plane so this gap is here but when you are seeing the articulated area you will realize that there is no gap both the condyles are touching both the tibial surface so obliquity is there in the bone itself in anatomical position you cannot keep this shaft vertically straight once you will make the shaft vertically straight the one condyle is touching the ground but the gap will come on the another condyle so this is again the very important line to understand whenever we are keeping the bone in anatomical position the lower surface of both femoral condyle should touch the horizontal plane and it is the most important thing and once you will keep this in the uh, horizontal plane you will realize that shaft automatically become oblique clear so this is the key feature behind the anatomical placement of the femur so here also you can see that in this diagram if i am holding the individual femur i am keeping this shaft oblique so the lower ends are medially and upper ends are laterally placed clear now what are the features of upper end now upper end is having a head neck greater trochanter lesser trochanter so what these features are now this is known as head of the femur this portion is known as neck of the femur this part is known as greater trochanter and this small projection on the medial side is known as lesser trochanter here posteriorly also you can appreciate this is the lesser trochanter this is the greater trochanter this is the posterior part of the neck and this is the head of the femur now the junction of the neck and shaft is marked by intertrochanteric line anteriorly and intertrochanteric crest posteriorly now these are the two very important concept to understand that there is a two thing one is known as line another is known as crest so line is a feature of anterior part of the femur while the crest is a feature of posterior surface now in these two diagram this is the anterior surface so here is the junction and this is known as intertrochanteric line so line is a feature of anterior surface now when you will see the posteriorly you will find again a projection and this projection is known as crest so crest is a feature of posterior surface so whenever you are holding the femur in your hand you have to keep this thing in mind that intertrochanteric line and intertrochanteric crest are the two lines but one is on the anterior side and the crest is on the posterior side 
Now, what are the important thing about the head of the femur? Now, you know that head is going to form the ball and socket. So, it is a sphere shaped structure, but it is not complete sphere, it is two third of the sphere. So, here you can see that this is a two third part of a sphere. Now, in this head, you know that there is a covering of articular hyaline cartilage just like a, any other synovial joint. So, synovial joints are covered by the end of the bones are covered by the hyaline cartilage. So, it is also covered by the hyaline cartilage, but there is a small depression is present on the head of femur which is not covered by the cartilage and this is known as fovea. What is that? Fovea or it is also known as pit of the head of femur. Now, this fovea or pit is present below the center of the head and it provides attachment to a very important ligament and that is known as ligament of the head of femur or it is also known as ligamentum teres femoris ligamentum teres femoris so here you can see this this is the green color triangular ligament and this green color triangular ligament is known as ligament of the head of femur or ligamentum teres femoris now this ligament is important because it is carrying the blood vessels which are supplying this part of the head of femur and these blood vessels are again the question of your university exam so many times you have this question what are the contents of ligament of the head of femur so they it contains the blood vessels which are known as acetabular branch and these branch are the branches of obturator artery and medial circumflex femoral artery so this is the important question for your exam now what about the neck of the femur the neck of femur is a connection between the head and shaft so this is the shaft and this is the head now in between you are having this portion which is known as neck of the femur now when you will see the neck neck is around 5 cm long so this is the 5 cm long neck now the angle between the neck and the shaft is known as neck shaft angle. So, this is the neck and this is the shaft. Now, in between you are having an angle. Now, this angle is known as neck shaft angle and its value is again for your exam purpose 125 degree is in the adult and it is more wider in the child which is around 160 degree. The angle is important because it is carrying your limbs away from your hip joint. Now, the neck is having upper and lower border, anterior and posterior surface. So, when you will see this neck, you will realize that this will become the upper border of the neck, this will become the inferior or the lower border of the neck, this is the anterior surface of the neck and this is the posterior surface of the neck. So, you have to first identify the neck, then and then you have to identify the borders and the surfaces. Now, the upper border meets with the greater trochanter. So, this part is known as greater trochanter. So, here you can see this upper border is meeting with the greater trochanter, while the lower border meets with the lesser trochanter which is present here. Clear? So, in this diagram which is a posterior view, you can also see this is your lesser trochanter, this is your greater trochanter. Now, here is the upper border which is meeting with the greater trochanter. This is the lower border which is meeting with the lesser trochanter. Now, this is very important concept to understand that whenever you are talking about the attachment of the capsule of hip joint, it is not similar on anterior surface of the neck and posterior surface of the neck. So, you have to first understand that the neck of the femur is present inside the hip joint. So, it is known as intracapsular structure. Intracapsular means the part of the joint which uh, bone which lies inside the joint. So, the neck of the femur is also a part of the joint. So, it is known as intracapsular. But my dear students, the attachment of capsule is not uniform all around the neck. And that's why it is a very commonly asked question. So, the anterior surface is completely intracapsular while the 
posterior surface is not completely intracapsular, its only medial half is intracapsular. Now, what is the exact meaning? Now, here you can see that this is the lower part or lower end of the anterior uh, placement of the neck. Now, here you will have the shaft will start. So, here you can see that this is the capsule and the complete neck is inside the capsule. But when you will see the posterior view, now here you can see the posterior view, this is the sacrum. So, here on the posterior side, you can see this is the crest, which is a junction of the shaft and the neck. But here, the capsule is, uh, is attached only up to this area. So, what will happen that this medial part of the posterior surface of neck is giving attachment to the your capsule. So, anteriorly the capsule is attached till intertrochanteric line, but posteriorly it is not approaching till this crest. Posteriorly the capsule is attached almost midway of the posterior surface of the neck. So, this portion between the crest and this attachment is remain outside the capsule. So, this is the important question to keep in mind that the anterior surface of the neck is a part or intracapsular, but posterior surface is not completely intracapsular. Clear? Now, what about the other features of the neck? Now, anterior surface has oblique lines and these oblique lines are known as ridges and this is again the question of exam that why the ridges are present on anterior surface. It is because of the retinocular fibers of your fibrous capsule of hip joint. So, when you will see the dry femur in the dissection hole, you will realize that the multiple lines are present here. Now, these lines are known as ridges, which are representing the retinocular fibers of fibrous capsule. The posterior surface is having a shallow groove and this groove is facing towards the trochanteric fossa that I will tell you what is trochanteric fossa and this groove is actually lodges the tendon of a muscle that is known as obturator externus. So, this is again the question for your spotting or viva that name the muscle which grooves the posterior surface of the neck of femur answer is tendon of obturator externus. Now, here you can see that this is the posterior surface and here you are having a shallow groove when you will see the dry bone in your dissection hall. Now, here you can appreciate the placement of the muscle is known as obturator externus. Now, obturator externus arises from the external surface of the obturator membrane. That means it arises from the anterior aspect of your obturator margins of the foramen. So, it is arising from the anterior side and then it is going laterally. Now, once it will make a lateral turn, it comes on the posterior side of the neck of femur and ultimately it will approach towards the trochanteric fossa which is present here on the inner side of this greater trochanter. So, this tendon will create a shallow groove here on the posterior aspect of this part of the neck which is extra capsular. Now, what about the greater trochanter? Greater trochanter is a quadrilateral projection. That means it is having the four sides and it forms the it present at the junction of the neck and the shaft. Now, here you can see this is the neck, this is the shaft. Now, this is your intertrochanteric line anteriorly. Now, in this area, you will have this projection and this projection is known as the greater trochanter. Now, this greater trochanter is having upper and lower or the posterior border. The upper border is having the apex. So, this point is known as upper border and this highest peak of this upper border is known as apex. Now, this apex of the greater trochanter receives a one muscle is known as pyriformis that I explain you in the coming slide and the posterior border become the part of the crest which is a feature of posterior surface. Now, here you can see the muscle named is pyriformis. Now, this pyriformis or piriformis muscle is arising from the ventral surface of the sacrum. Now, this piriformis muscle after taking origin from the sacrum will go laterally and it will come out through the 
greater sciatic foramen which is present here. Now here you will have the two ligaments. So these notch will convert into the foramen and this piriformis muscle will come out from the greater sciatic foramen and it will insert on this apex of the greater trochanter of the femur. Clear? So which is the attachment or you have this question very commonly. What is the attachment at the apex of greater trochanter? Answer is the tendon of piriformis muscle. Now, what are the surfaces of greater trochanter? You are having anterior surface, lateral surface and medial surface. So this is your anterior surface. This will become the lateral surface and this will become the medial surface of greater trochanter. Now this anterior surface of the greater trochanter receives the insertion of one muscle is known as gluteus minimus. So gluteus minimus will come here. Then you will have the lateral surface. On the lateral surface you will have one muscle is known as gluteus medius. So it is having gluteus medius. While the medial surface is having one fossa is known as trochanteric fossa which I just told you. Now this fossa is for the insertion of obturator externus muscle and above the fossa there is one more impression here and that impression receives the obturator internus muscle with the gamulus. Clear? So you have to first keep this thing in mind that this greater trochanter basically receiving the glutei muscle. Which glutei? Gluteus minimus and medius not maximus. Apart from that on its inner side, you have the two important muscle, obturator externus and internus. Obturator externus will enter into the fossa that is known as trochanteric fossa, while the internus insert on the impression above the fossa. Clear? Now here you will see one by one, this is the gluteus minimus. Now you know that gluteus minimus arises from the gluteal surface of the hip bone. So it is arising here. Now, after taking origin, it is going laterally and it will insert here. Now there is a ridge is present. Now on this ridge, on anterior surface, you will have the insertion of gluteus minimus. Now the space is present between the minimus and the bone and this space is having the bursa which prevent the friction between the tendon of the gluteus minimus and the bone. In the same way, here if you will see this diagram, what you are able to appreciate this is the lateral view of your right side, uh, this left side. Now this is my left side and if you will see the lateral view, you are able to see both glutei, gluteus minimus and gluteus medius. So this is the first gluteus minimus. Now this gluteus minimus is arising from here of the gluteal surface and it is inserting here on the anterior side of greater trochanter. Now if you will place the gluteus medius, you know that these muscles are present layer by layer, maximus, then below the maximus medius and below the medius minimus. So this is now the origin of your gluteus medius. Now this gluteus medius is inserting here on the lateral aspect, not on the anterior aspect. Clear? So you have to understand that greater trochanter anteriorly receiving the gluteus minimus and laterally it is receiving gluteus medius and the areas which are which are present here in between they are having the bursas and these bursas prevent the friction between the tendon and the bone. Now in this video you can appreciate this that when we are having these muscles how they are arranged. Now this is first you can see this is the one muscle which is on the lateral side is gluteus minimus and you can see the origin of your obturator externus muscle anteriorly. Now if you will rotate this pelvis, now if I will rotate this pelvis, what you are able to appreciate the arrangement of the tendon, how the tendon is approaching. So here the tendon is coming directly but when you will see posterior side, now in this diagram you can appreciate that there are two important tendons are seen. Now this is the origin of your obturator internus. Now you can see it is inside the pelvis or you can say posterior surface of obturator membrane. 
and this tendon is going laterally and it will insert here on the impression on the inner side of your greater trochanter. But below that you are having this tendon. Now this is the tendon of obturator externus which is coming from anteriorly making it turn behind the neck creating a groove on the neck and ultimately will insert into the fossa which is present here is known as trochanteric fossa. Clear? So now the question is very important for your exam that which tendon creates groove below the uh, in, in the ischial uh, area or ischium of the hip bone. Now here you can see this is the ischium part of the hip bone and just above the ischial tuberosity you are also having a shallow groove. Now this shallow groove of the hip bone is created by this tendon of obturator internus muscle. Clear? So if you will see this again what you are able to understand that initially when you are talking about the placement of the muscles, the muscles are arranged here in the anterior aspect. But once the rotation will occur, you will realize that the rotation when you will take the posterior surface of the pelvis, you will realize that the obturator internus is arising and going horizontally. Clear? So this is the important idea about obturator internus and externus and this is your gluteus medius sorry minimus muscle clear now here you will find the placement of the trochanteric fossa now where you will find trochanteric fossa i told you when you will rotate the femur on the inner side of the femur here you can see this area now this groove is your trochanteric fossa so trochanteric fossa is a prominent depression on the medial surface of the greater trochanter of the femur. Now you have the lesser trochanter. Now lesser trochanter is a conical projection on the medial side which you can see here. Now on the lesser trochanter you are having the attachment of a conjoint tendon or a combined tendon of the two muscle. One is your iliacus which is coming from the iliac fossa and there is one muscle which is coming from the lateral side of your lumbar vertebras and both the muscles are joining in lower part to form a common tendon which is known as tendon iliosuas. It is iliosuas. Ilio means iliacus, suas means suas major. So this combined tendon will insert here on the lesser trochanter. Now what about quadrate tubercle? Now when you are reading this femur, you will have this term quadrate tubercle. So quadrate tubercle is a feature of posterior surface of upper end not anterior surface. Now on the posterior surface of the upper end you are having the intertrochanteric crest. So when you will see the posterior side you are having this crest. Now the middle of the crest is having a elevation. Now this middle elevation is known as quadrate tubercle. Now this quadrate tubercle give attachment to a muscle is known as quadratus femoris which you can appreciate in this diagram that it is a horizontal muscle which is having one attachment on the ischial tuberosity and another attachment on this part of crest which is known as quadrate tubercle. So the muscle is quadratus femoris and the tubercle is quadrate tubercle on the posterior side of upper end. Now, these are the two important terms which you will read in the book. One is spiral line, another is pectineal line. So you have the pectineal line in hip bone also and you have the pectineal line in femur also. Now what is the difference? Now where you will find these two lines? Now the first thing is about the intertrochanteric line. Now intertrochanteric line is a feature of the anterior surface. Now from the anterior part this intertrochanteric line continue below as a spiral line. So this is the first concept that if I am saying that where is the anterior surface. Now this is the anterior surface which is having the intertrochanteric line. Now this line further continue as a line and this line is known as a spiral line. So this segment is become a spiral line and above that this front segment is intertrochanteric line. Now this spiral line will continue downwards posteriorly as a one of the border of linea aspera. 
and that is the medial border. So, a spiral line winds around the shaft, so it make it winds, so it make a loop around the shaft below the lesser trochanter, so it is below the lesser trochanter and appears on the posterior surface. While when we we'll talk about the pectineal line, pectineal line of the femur is a feature of again the posterior aspect in the proximal shaft and the pectineal line extends from the great lesser trochanter of your femur to the linea aspera and merge with the intermediate zone. So, here you can see that this is your pectineal line. So, if I will draw both the line in a single bone, if I will draw both the line in a single bone, so this will become your pectineal line and this is your spiral line, clear? So, these are the two different lines, they are not the same. You have to understand that this pectineal line receives the insertion of a muscle is known as pectineous muscle. While this part of the spiral line give origin to a vastus medialis muscle. So, the spiral line is giving origin to the vastus medialis while the pectineal line receiving the insertion of pectineus. So, you have to be very careful when you are marking these two lines. Again, I will tell you that there are two things to understand. One is a spiral line, another is pectineal line. Now, a spiral line is a continuation of intertrochanteric line. So, this is our intertrochanteric line. Now, once you will re reach to the medial end of intertrochanteric line, this line automatically make a loop or it wind around this and comes on the posterior side below the lesser trochanter. So, this is your lesser trochanter and it winds posteriorly below the lesser trochanter and this will become a spiral line. But pectineal line is starts from the lower end of your lesser trochanter and then it will go down and it merge with the intermediate part of your linea aspera. So, this is your intermediate part of the linea aspera and this green color line is representing your pectineal line, clear? Now, here in this clip, you can appreciate both the lines. So, this is your uh, femur. Now, if you will rotate it, now this is your anteriorly placed intertrochanteric line, which is making a spiral loop and then it will continue downward as a your spiral line, clear? While if I have to do, draw the pectineal line, I will make a pectineal line from the lesser trochanter, clear? So, this is become important to understand that this is your anteriorly intertrochanteric line, continue as a spiral line and a spiral line will go downward, become the medial lip of your linea aspera and here will become is your pectineal line, which will merge with this intermediate part of linea aspera. Now, what about the shaft of the femur? The shaft of femur is divided into the upper, middle and lower one third and the middle one third is the narrowest part of the shaft. In middle one third, posteriorly there is a ridge which I already told you is known as linea aspera and it has the medial and lateral lip. Now, in this diagram, if you will see, this is your middle portion or you can say this is the we can divide this whole shaft into the three parts, upper one third, lower one third and this is your middle one third. Now, in this middle one third, you will find that this linea aspera is having only the two lips. One is your medial lip which is present on the medial side and the lateral lip which is present on the lateral side. And the intermediate zone is very thin. But if you will trace these two lines in upper and lower part, you will realize that they will diverge. So, in the upper part, this is continue with the spiral line, which we have already discussed. And in the lateral part, you will realize that here is present of a small roughness and this is known as gluteal tuberosity. So, this lateral lip will become the lateral border of the gluteal tuberosity like this. It is not continue with the medial border of the gluteal tuberosity, it will continue with the lateral border of the gluteal tuberosity like this, clear? So, when the diverge, these both 
part diverge in the upper part, a posterior surface will appear in the upper one third of your femur. In the same way, if you will see the lower part, in the lower part these both will diverge again and you are having one more posterior surface and this posterior surface is known as popliteal surface and these lines are known as supracondylar lines because they are above the condyles of femur. So this will become medial supracondylar line or ridge, this will become lateral supracondylar line or ridge. So in this bone, if you will see the posterior surface and somebody will ask you what is this surface? So this surface is the popliteal surface enclosed between the medial and lateral supracondylar line. Now what is this area is known as? Now this area is known as gluteal tuberosity. Now this gluteal tuberosity receives the insertion of one fourth part of gluteus maximus muscle. So in upper part both lip diverge and they enclose the gluteal tuberosity. In lower part again the both lips diverge and they will form the supracondylar lines which encloses the popliteal surface. Now here if you will see the shaft in the lower part and if I will cut it in the midline you can appreciate here that this shaft is having the two elevations here. This is a mid shaft. So these are the two lips of your linea aspera and this will become intermediate part of the linea aspera. And the remaining part of the shaft is not having any other prominent line. But still we consider this one side is the medial border, one side is as a lateral border and now we can see this is become anterior surface, this will become medial surface and this will become lateral surface of your shaft of the femur. But my dear students, you have to keep this thing in mind that the lateral border and medial borders are not prominent. The most prominent border which you are able to appreciate is only the posteriorly placed linea aspera. Clear? So this is the important thing to always understand that whenever you are having the femur, the prominent border is placed posteriorly only. Because in this cut section also, you can appreciate that this bone is having the posteriorly linea aspera and the remaining surface is, remaining part is, is smooth. Clear? Now, what is about the gluteal tuberosity? I already told you that gluteal tuberosity is here which is a feature of the upper part of the posterior surface and this gluteal tuberosity is giving attachment to the gluteus maximus. Now what about the lower end of the femur? The lower end of the femur is having two large condyles. One condyle is placed on the medial side is known as medial condyle, one is known as lateral condyle. Anteriorly both condyles continue with each other. So you can see anteriorly they are continue but posteriorly there is a presence of a notch and this is known as intercondylar notch or it is having intercondylar fossa. Now the articular surface of condyles are divided into the two part, patellar part and tibial part. Now this is the important thing to understand that when you will see this surface, this articular surface. This articular surface is divided into the two part. Now this anterior smaller area is known as patellar part and the posterior remaining part is going to make a joint with the tibia. So this is known as tibial part of the condyles. Now how which you can appreciate here that this is the joint which you are seeing here. This is the knee joint and this is the joint of my left knee. Now here anteriorly you can see this is the placement of a bone is known as patella. Now if we will remove this patella and then we will see this, you will realize that how the uh, articular surface has been divided. So this is the anterior view. Now if we will see the side view, lateral view, you can see that this is the whole articular surface. Now this is the posterior view where still the tibial condyles, tibial articular surface is visible. But if we will remove this patella, you will find that behind the patella the articular surface is present. So we have removed this, once you will remove, now here you can see 
the articular surface is still visible. So this surface is known as patellar surface. Remaining surface is going to make a joint with the tibia that is known as tibial surface. Clear? So whenever you are having the lower end or lower part of the femur, you have the two surfaces, patellar surface and tibial surface. The patellar surface is the surface which is going to make a joint with the patella. Now, what are the features of the lateral condyle? Now, when you will see the lateral condyle, you have to rotate this femur laterally. Now, in this lateral part, you are able to appreciate the two important features. Now, what this feature is, there is a green color area. Now, this is the groove for the tendon of popliteus muscle. Now, this is a very, very commonly asked question. When you will see the lateral condyle, lateral surface, you are able to appreciate a groove. And that groove is for the muscle, name is popliteus muscle. Clear? Now, there is a one more feature on the medial side, which is known as adductor tubercle. So now when you will see this bone, now this projection on the medial side is known as adductor tubercle. Now this adductor tubercle receives the lower end of a big muscle is known as adductor magnus. Now here you can see this is the adductor magnus which is arising from the conjoint ischiopubic rami and ischial tuberosity. Now this lower end of the adductor magnus will go and attach to this point which is known as adductor magnus. This is the posterior view where you will find that the ischial fibers, that means the fibers those are arising from the ischial tuberosity are going to attach on this adductor tubercle. Clear? So on the both condyles you are having two important questions. On the lateral side of the lateral condyle there is a groove, that groove is for the popliteus and on the medial condyle you are having a bony projection is known as adductor tubercle for the attachment of lower part or ischial part of adductor magnus. Now here overall you can see the femur. So this is the femur front surface, this is your left side femur, head, lower end, greater trochanter. Now on the greater trochanter you are having the muscles like gluteus medius and minimus. This is your lesser trochanter where you have the muscle is iliacus and swast major. This is the posterior ridge is known as linea aspera which is having upward and bi downward bifurcations. And in, this is your patellar surface anteriorly and the remaining surface is known as tibial surface of your lower end of the femur. So here you can see this is the lower end where and this is the upper end of the femur and inside the greater trochanter you are having the trochanteric fossa. Clear? So at the end of this class of the femur, now we are able to understand how to identify the upper and lower end of the femur, what is the anatomical position of the bone and the most important thing is that what are the different bony features of this bone anterior part of the bone, upper end of the bone, posterior part of the bone and lower end of the bone. So this is all for today's class. Thank you.